From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now, at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now, welcome, Inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. Back in the office today, after a few days with my wife and daughter, visiting our son in Annapolis, Maryland, where he's just completed a 43-day grind for the newest midshipman of the United States Naval Academy. It's called Plebe Summer. Through a few online photo streams from the Academy and others, parents like us got sort of a voyeur's view of the days on the yard, from the 6 a.m. workouts on Rip Miller Field to the 10 p.m. renditions of Taps and the thousand or so plebes singing Navy Blue and Gold before lights went out. Such is the life of leaders in training in the nation's service academies, which, in the Navy's case, stretches 175 years back to 1845 when it was founded by Secretary of the Navy George Bancroft on the grounds of the former Fort Severn at the confluence of the Severn River and Chesapeake Bay. A closer view of the goings-on of the class of 2027 came a few weeks ago when members of the Annapolis class of 1977, their predecessors by 50 years, came for a visit presenting each plebe with their first challenge coin, a vaunted military tradition for their role as another link in the chain. Now, 215 miles northwest of the Naval Academy sits its arch rival, the United States Military Academy at West Point, where the cadet class of 2027 has endured a similar indoctrination, capped off by a similar visit by their 1977 forebears in arms, hardening the steel in their swords for what's to come. Army and Navy may be opponents on the athletic field, but they're comrades when it counts. Joining forces, along with their allies, to confront the superpower competition from China and Russia, and providing our country a group of leaders that will span the better part of the rest of the 21st century. In a minute, we'll lay down our arms here in the library of the New York Stock Exchange as well, taking up microphones with a certain West Point graduate from the class of 77, one of the great living legends of Wall Street, and the founder and chairman emeritus of Virtu Financial, Mr. Vincent Viola. Our conversation with Vinnie Viola on markets, the art and technology of trading, the state of the world, and the new era of superpower competition, and yeah, a little thoroughbred racing and some hockey as well. It's all coming up right after this. Connecting the opportunity is just part of the hustle. Opportunity is using data to create a competitive advantage. It's raising capital to help companies change the world. It's making complicated financial concepts seem simple. Opportunity is making the dream of home ownership a reality. Writing new rules and redefining the game. And driving the world forward to a greener energy future. Opportunity is setting a goal. And charting a course to get there. Sometimes the only thing standing between you and opportunity is someone who can make the connection. At ICE, we connect people to opportunity. Our guest today, Vinny Viola, is the founder and chairman emeritus of Virtu Financial. An early leader in electronic trading, Vinny served as CEO and chairman since the company's founding in 2008 until 2013. And prior to Virtu, he founded three financial services companies and began his career after Army service on the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange, the old NYMEX, now part of ICE's rival CME, back in 1982, later serving as vice chairman, then chairman, from 2001 to 2004. Vinny, welcome inside the ICE House. It's great to be here, Josh. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. You and I were talking a bit last week. What was it like for you and your classmates to return to the plane at West Point to inspect the cadets who walked today in your boot prints? 
It's quite surreal. I'd like to use the word uh, inspiring. We had 68 of our class. We graduated 695 young officers on June 8th, 1977, and 68 of us showed up. And of the 68, all but five of us did 12 and a half of the 14 mile walk back. Myself and a couple of the classmates waited at the ski slope and we took the overland route. It was about a little bit over two miles, but it was absolutely electric and inspiring to see the class. You guys, the 68 of you, share stories of what it was like 50 years ago? Oh, gosh, we did. It's a very almost spiritual connection, I think, amongst uh, classmates and fellow graduates. Just a quick vignette, myself and a couple of my classmates were in the last rank of our group, and behind us, there were approximately another 250 older graduates and some younger graduates. So it was about 320 graduates that took the walk, the, the march back. And uh, the old guys were start, started yelling at us about a mile into our march towards the superintendent's house is where it ends, saying, if you're not going to keep up, step aside. And I just at, rang memories of plea beer to me. So I guess the place never changes. The area in which West Point is situated in Hudson River Valley was recently devastated by flooding. Did you see any of the lingering effects of the area and the Corps of Cadets? It's very interesting you, you mentioned that, Josh. I met briefly with the superintendent following the march back, and he shared with me that they've suffered over $100 million of damage, wow. and uh, they're working real hard. Senator Schumer's just, a, uh, just been a proterian supporter of the military academy to get the uh, damage completely uh, he completely was Toby's damaged. dominator that's wonderful but you wouldn't know it oh, yeah. it was just a Herculean effort to get the place really just completely shining but there's been some severe road damage and they'll, they'll, they'll work it they'll get it they'll get it done the head of the Corps of Engineers visited magnificent ge geographic location majestic yeah. the military academy, how it sits, and you can understand its strategic importance during the Revolutionary War. Sure. I mean, in a broader sense, Vinny, what's your assessment of the quality of leaders we're making now, places like West Point, Annapolis, and the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, are they up to the challenges you think that lie ahead? Oh, absolutely. I think the young men and women, the cadets, midshipmen, and airmen, young airmen, they, they're called all, cadets also, are so much more vibrant, committed, aware of their obligation, their profession, than we were 50 years ago, I could tell you that. They're just very impressive. And uh, I, I'm very bullish about our military and about our officer corps. You back then served in the 101st Airborne, graduated from Ranger School at a very different time. Vietnam, still an open wound at the time. President Carter wrestled with the Iran hostage crisis, including the failed rescue attempt, Operation Eagle Claw at Desert One. What was it like to serve between this really in interesting time between the end of the Vietnam era and the beginning of the Reagan era? Uh, that's a fantastic question. My experience at the academy was really defined by professors who were junior officers who had, if not just returned from combat in Vietnam, had returned from combat not more than a couple of years previous. So a typical class would stop five to 10 minutes short of its scheduled end. And invariably a professor would share with us the obligations of combat leadership. Mm. And in many cases, they would share personal stories. I'll never forget one Saturday morning. We went, we went to school six days a week when I was a cadet till one o'clock on Saturday. And as I remember on Saturday mornings, we started real early and we had, seemed like an hour and a half plus of mathematics. And at the academy, you, you have to recite and defend your solution to a mathematical problem every day. And uh, I had one major, and his last name was DeWitt, and he was a Silver Star recipient in Vietnam. And I'll never forget him 
stopping the recitations and on the chalkboard sketching out an ambush mm. that his company had been lured into by an NVA, regular NVA unit. I, I could remember with great detail how he put the chalk to the board and how he explained his actions in that battle, that fight. Someone who was followed you about nine years after you graduated from West Point was Mark Esper from the class of 1986. The former Secretary of Defense was on this show a couple of months ago. And among other things, he talked about the Modern War Institute, which he chairs. Here's part of what he said in that conversation. My view was technology was going to be the game changer. And yet, despite all my work, despite standing up Army Futures Command in, in the Army, DOD is still not at the point where it can quickly adopt innovative technologies at the speed of, of relevance, at, at a speed that will beat the Chinese to the punch, particularly in technologies like AI and robotics and, and quantum. So, Vinny, you know a thing or two about the speed of technologies from all that mathematics that are required to win on the battlefield or in the markets. What's your assessment of where we are the way Mark talks about it? Well, first of all, Mark is a good friend, and he's a fellow Screaming Eagle, Distinguished Service, Persian Gulf One, and we've been actively involved philanthropically in the support of the Modern Warfare Institute. In fact, the first Distinguished Chair is a good friend named retired four-star Chuck Jacoby. I, I tell you that it's pretext. Mm -hmm. I think Mark is re reflecting a sense of urgency that is defined by his unique understanding of the Chinese, the PLA's focus to modernize their army. That is a central precept in uh, Xi Jinping and quite frankly, Jing Jimin's rejuvenation of China strategic initiative or purpose. I am a little bit more optimistic I think that we have a strategic culture in the Army around the divide between the human and technology and how that interface will evolve in the model battlefield. The modern battlefield is a hybrid environment. We used to call it irregular. Now mm -hmm. it's a multi-domain and hybrid. All technologies that you could imagine are brought to bear from electromagnetic warfare to cyber warfare to communication disruptions to automated decision making around creation of targets and destruction of targets and i think it is it is a matter of public private efficiency and i believe that the leaders in our military are aware of it and excited by it so Mark talks about Futures Command. It's just, just a fantastic cutting-edge command, and I think it's making a difference. You talk about on the battlefield, off the battlefield. Xi Jinping this week announces you know, dramatically slower Chinese economy, declines after many years of revealing economic statistics to reveal unemployment among the younger generation, perhaps, sort of shielding what reality might be after beginning with Zhang Zemin through Hu Jintao and now Xi Jinping kind of a, a transparency because they were doing so well. Maybe they're not doing so well now in terms of cultural competition between the way our society in the West is based and the Chinese society. We might be winning that battle as well. It's interesting. Marx sort of described an arc of totalitarian revolution and he he, he basically described disruption of society and then transformation to socialist construct and then eventual communism. And we all know the effect of Stalin and the creation of the Soviet Union and the consolidation of the co communist revolution in the, in the old Soviet Union. Mao was a devotee of Stalin, and it wasn't really until Stalin passed that Mao became uber-confident around deploying his vision of Marxist-Leninism, Marxist-Leninist theory within society. So, to, not to go into a Vinnie Ramble, mm -hmm. when Deng Xiaoping decided that they needed 
to look at the economic practices of the industrial West to get China back up on its feet after the rapprochement by President Nixon and Henry Kissinger, he understood that he had to do this without sacrificing complete devotion to Marxist-Leninist principles. And if you really study China from the perspective of Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party, it really starts and begins with Marx and Lenin and strict adherence to the ideology, which professes a complete revolution of society's constructs as defined, particularly in the West, from the end of the Napoleonic Wars through 1949. So why do I sort of kind of belabor this point mm. it starts with the idea that there's no concept of reform in pure Marxist Lenin philosophy when the uprisings in Hungary happened in 1956 Mao was adamant that they had to be militarily struck down by that time Khrushchev was being more and more intimidated, quite frankly, by Mao's assumption of world leadership of the communist movement, and of course, 1968. So from Xi Jinping's standpoint, first and foremost, the first purpose is to strict adherence to, to Marxist principles, with a central leader in the form of Xi Jinping. The second is to make contiguous national unity around the geography as he defines China which we can get back to in a little bit, includes obviously Taiwan. You can see how they've gone about the absorption of Hong Kong. They're very serious about this. And the third principle or driver is create an economy where the Chinese people enjoy their a livelihood and a mobility. And the fourth is the modernization of their military. But getting to your point, because I will answer your question, there's an inherent friction there. So Xi Jinping has to balance a return almost from a private, entrepreneurially motivated economy to a almost quasi-socialist form of economy where these state-owned mm. companies are helped out by the entrepreneurial and the private class. But he's got to monitor that class. Because creativity and entrepreneurialism is born of what? The freedom to think, right? Creatively, creatively reform an entity, an idea. So it's a, it's a very tough balance for him. Uh, I don't know if that answers your no, question. No, it does. But, but uh, the point I'm making is, there's no leader in post-Mao that has uh, written more on pure Marxist ideology than Xi Jinping. His father was a respected uh, member of the party, and he was a victim of the Cultural Revolution. So he was rusticated, and Xi Jinping's worldview was formed by his immediate family's experience during the Cultural Revolution. And nothing more reflected the idea of the creativity and entrepreneurism of the Chinese people than, I would say, Pete, this string of IPOs here at the New York Stock yeah. Exchange from, I wouldn't remember the start date because it probably predated me, but we certainly had Alibaba here. And then, you know, it all dried up around 2020, 20, 2019. And, you know, it, it may not come again because I think this was the beginning of the crackdown in Beijing. Yeah, it's very interesting. In 2017, I had the privilege of enjoying a lunch with Henry Kissinger, and he made the point that he had just gotten back from China. He shared the point with me that Xi Jinping was consolidating power under the auspice that, in fact, the private class in China, the entrepreneurial class, the capitalist class, ha had been corrupted and was corrupt and under the guise of, of anti-corruption, they started to modify the behavior of people like Jack Ma, who's a larger-than-life 
creative capitalist entrepreneur. Yep. So this is very powerful stuff. I mean, talking about Lenin and Khrushchev, a couple of years after you left the army in 1987, at about the time I was graduating college, President Reagan flew Air Force One to Berlin and took the stage in front of the Brandenburg Gate. I just want to hear a little bit of that. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Chilling. Yeah, I mean, Vinny, I was with President Clinton during many meetings with President Yeltsin from Hyde Park to the White House to the 50th anniversary of VE Day in Moscow. And then Clinton's successors, Bush 43, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and now Joe Biden have had to confront a very different leader in Vladimir Putin. Collectively, Vinny, how do you think our leaders have delivered the message to Putin compared to the way Reagan did to Gorbachev? Generally speaking, I think our American society lacks an, aware, uh, an awareness of, we lack strategic culture. And I think our leaders, quite frankly, reflect that. I think the American population generally can't possibly have a visceral appreciation of our good fortune because we know we know nothing different mm. but to a person like Vladimir Putin who was raised with a very very severe understanding of how to and he was trained how to maintain an empire was the Soviet Union really is the first derivative of the Russian Empire. And the Russian Empire has always behaved sloth-like. It's really primarily because of their disparate geography and, quite frankly, their lack of naturally efficient geography and topography. I don't think we understood the vituperative experience that he had as a young KJB officer in East Germany. Mm -hmm. And these are primary defining emotional experiences sure. that inform people's behavior. You know, Stalin was weeks away from being an Orthodox priest in seminary. He was beyond brilliant theologically. But his his eyewitness of the repression, the Tsarist repression led him to revolutionary dedication. And when people are motivated by visceral primary experience, sometimes it's hard for them to be open-minded. Of course, uh, Putin has let us know that 2004, 2007, the invasion, invasion of South Ostia in, in Georgia, 2008, and of course, 2014, he was able to walk green-clad people into Crimea unopposed. It's a very, very difficult proposition for the West as we understand it. This, this post-industrial, highly activated society that we would describe as the West. But I, I think there's a point to be made that's extremely important here. Once people experience the magnificence, the, the majesty of liberty, it's very hard for them to go back to subjugation. I was privileged to visit uh, Ukraine in 2000, right prior to COVID, and to visit some of the forward positions, which were kinetic at the time, and which are now basically right along the gradient, the 600 mile long gradient, of course, we were in armored vehicles, but we were getting passed by constantly by Toyotas, uh, Camrys, and and SUVs with 
Ukrainian civilians in camouflage uniforms with their rucksack in the next in the rear seat and their weapon, a range of assault weapons. And it was chilling to me because I realized that, well, first I realized, one, that there was going to be a broader conflict to come. Two, I realized that these people were going to fight to the death for what they had uh, experienced as liberty and freedom and sort of that self-awareness. Because it's really the spirit of the individual that drives society stability. You know, one, one of the founding principles of our nation was the pursuit of happiness mm -hmm. grounded in personal responsibility but informed by liberty, right? And they're strong motivating factors, individuals. I mean, talking about the visceral appreciation of good fortune, as you say, it might be particularly strong, and to add to that bucket, liberty as well, for kids of immigrants who grew up in places like Brooklyn. You mm. know, I have a history of working with some notable Italian American leaders who grew up in these parts. Joe Plumeri, who started in Trenton before going to work for Sandy Weil and Frank Bisignano. And Frank often talks about how his father, a first generation child of immigrants, spent his life in the uniform of his new country. Vinny, your dad, John, served in the army in World War II. How did that affect you? Well, okay, so you got me now because it triggers emotions. My dad was uh, three years old when he came from Italy, uh, him and his two older brothers. And he made the invasion of North Africa in Operation Torch as an infantryman and, and soon thereafter became a supply sergeant and basically followed that army. It was Mark, on the command of Mark Clark and mm -hmm. then eventually G General Patton took over and made the invasion from there of Sicily, Anzio, fought up right through Monte Cassino and then was requisitioned as a replacement soldier to the Battle of the Bulge. And my, my dad went to the battalion that he was going to replace. It was the battalion that his older brother was serving in from the 98th Infantry Division. That always sticks with me. I, I'm happy I get a chance to share that. Mm. I was somewhere eight or nine, I can't remember, and he said to me, we're gonna take a ride today on a Saturday. My dad is my best friend my whole life. And we drive up the Hudson River, cross over the Bear Mountain Bridge, and all of a sudden we enter this place that conjured to me something more powerful than any place I'd, I'd been. And it was the first day of cadet summer training what we call beast barracks in the old days, which is now called plebe summer. And my dad had served under a West Point junior officer in World War II, but he was there to find a friend of his who remained in the Army and was a, a sergeant major at the academy. I remember seeing these young men at the time, was all men, in white T-shirts, gray shorts, knee-high black silk mm. socks, and black dress shoes standing at attention on this flat promontory, promontory overlooking the Hudson. And my dad never spoke about the war till the day he died, never did. He told me about my uncles, they all served on both sides of my family, but that day changed my life. One thing that you and Joe Plumeri share, maybe about 15 years apart, is New York Law School, but neither of you ended up practicing law. Joe knocked on the door of what would become Travelers and eventually Citigroup, and you, you landed as a trader at the New York Mercantile Exchange, now owned and operated by CME Group. How did you end up in the NYMEX pits coming out of the Army? My dad got seriously ill in 1979. Um, my parents were well, my financial dependents by that point. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And there's a gentleman who's still a very, very dear friend, if not a brother to me, he's named Dominic Vassallo, who was just becoming a broker in the pits of the New York Mercantile Exchange. And if you, if you, just real quick history in the New York Mercantile Exchange, it was formed as the Butter and Cheese Exchange, and then it added eggs as one of its forward contracts. And these merchants tried to reduce the cacophony 
of prices and sounds around it. You know, and Donnie said, you know, I was going I was going to uh, pursue an engineering position. And I had an offer from Pfizer, and I had an, a, an offer from this engineering firm, and and I was, he said, y- 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 you're not going to those places. <laughs> he said, I grew up with you. You you would you would be really good at this. He says, come with me, because I had a three day break. I was still at the hundred first Airborne. He said, come with me. Let's go on a subway. I'll show you the exchange. And the elevated door opens on Four World Trade Center. I walk out. And there are these boards, and there are these numbers, and there are these pits, and there are these mostly men shouting across each other. So it reminded me of all of the primary, primary experiences of my youth. What, what were they? My dad was a hardworking guy, always had a second job. But every free moment he had, he would be handicapping the races. Mm-hmm. And I would go with him as much as I could and he would let me stand by the board, the tote board, and he'd come back and he'd quiz me on the changes of odds for various horses. I always wanted to please my dad, so I was pretty good in arithmetic. So I saw, so the price is changing on the boards, right? Third last, second last, last, right? High and low of the day. And they just jumped at me, almost in slow motion. And then I looked at the traders shouting across the ring at each other, I'm like, this is easy. I grew up in a house where everybody was screaming at each other all the time. And that, that sort of staccato and bravado of just wanting to communicate, not in anger. Kind of like time stood still. So there was a gentleman who owned the clearinghouse named Gil Meyerfeld, who became a role model and mentor to me. And then there was another gentleman who was larger than life, Herbie Weinberger, who was about six foot three, shocking red hair, combat infantryman's badge, and Patton's army and he said kid come over here how much money you have and I told him so I'll tell you what you put it in an account in my clearing house I'll clear you you're a West Pointer I was going I was finishing law school in the evening he said and the deal is you're going to you're going to serve on every com- every compliance and regulatory committee we have and go get them at the time it took about three months to become a member I just stood outside the, the pit and just absorbed it like a sponge, and I read every book I could on technical analysis. I was a big point-and-figure guy, and I started trading the same day as a, a dear friend who, unfortunately, I've been out of touch with. And he and I started together, and after the first day, we promised each other we'd make one trade a day because that way we wouldn't lose all our money and you know be out of the business. And... That's how I started. I mean, remarkable, similar story to Terry Duffy that he tells being at the, at the Mercantile Exchange, you know, getting a mentor who's going to help stake him or say he's going to clear him. I mean, you raised enough money to get your seat on the NYMEX back when it was member-owned, similar to the NYSC at the time. You were also working alongside another friend of mine, Charlie McGuffig, or Charlie Swan, as his great name guy. I read at the time. Just a great guy, great trader. And like talking about the great trader and what it was like, I want to just hear some of the sights and sounds of what the floor was like back then. What appears at first glance to be pure pandemonium is in reality a very structured business, as highly choreographed and orchestrated as any Broadway show. The New York Mercantile Exchange is a marketplace for buying and selling futures and options contracts in commodities. For instance, energy products such as crude oil, natural gas, gasoline, home heating oil, propane, and electricity, as well as metals like gold, silver, copper, aluminum, and platinum. But what does that matter to me, you might ask? And what does that matter to me, I might ask? That offer was was presented by Madeline Boyd, who's a dear friend. I know a voice from the pits like it was yesterday. I mean, you hear some of that, and you des- the way you describe looking at the board and seeing the numbers almost in slow motion, almost in a way that others might not have been able to see, certainly the people who weren't inside the exchange, the way you were brought in on that visit coming out of the 101st Airborne. But even that, those sights and sounds, which might have been the high watermark of the NYMEX, could you see an evolution of technology or revolution of technology coming? What did you see? My whole career has really been 
defined and enabled by the kindness of others. The this, this, this sincere kindness and teaching of others. And the, there was a chairman when I was first on the board. His name was Lou Gutman, who was a just brilliant man, brilliant man. And we were called to Chicago by Leo Malamed and Jack Sander. And I think Terry was just on the board. He was kind of a junior member like me. So he said, Vinny, you're going to come with me to Chicago because Leo is conceived of an electronic exchange and they're partners with Reuters and they're going to give us a chance to be their partners. Well, it made perfect sense to me. It made perfect sense to Lou, but now we had 742 members that we had to sort of bring along. It was a pretty difficult journey. Sort of was intuitively obvious to a casual observer that we would be able to replicate the central limit order book and then, of course, the execution of trades in an electronic domain informed by access to execution. But it was a tough battle. Terry Duffy and the CME had a tough battle. You had a tough battle. ICE had a tough battle. I mean, you served as chairman, uh, I think, from 2001 to 2004. And in your time leading NYMEX coincided with the emergence in 2000 of another major competitor, Jeff Sprecher, the founder of Intercontinental Exchange, which would eventually buy the New York Board of Trade, the London Petroleum Exchange, and this building, the NYSE. What was your sense of ICE and Jeff as it emerged on the scene? Here's how I describe Jeff, and I consider him a friend as well, Kelly. Hyperkinetic genius mind who is untirable and dominable. But the thing I most respect about Jeff is he has a great sense of humor. His self-deprecating humor is what I just think is it distinguishes him. And it's his natural state to compete and, quite frankly, to win. So when I first met Jeff, we both sort of agreed on the strategic premise that, hey, this is, this is going to happen. And the journey began. I could, I could do five podcasts on my relationship with Jeff, both as a friend and a competitor, but just a superstar human being. Obviously, you are part of what he's created. And it was a real tough time for the New York Exchanges, particularly because we were always younger cousins of the Chicago Exchanges. Of course. You know? and, and another very dear friend who's larger in life, you know, brilliant leader, Wall Street leader, is Gary Cohn. And sure. Gary, Gary was on our board at the time. And he's like, Vin, we, you know, we got to deal with this. This is, this is real. And without getting into the details, I guess I never intended on being chairman and the same gentleman that uh, the three or four sort of mentors that saw me when I had my seersucker suit, which I saved, you know, I spent the money that I had to buy and my attache case when I was walking around looking for entry to the exchange, they sat me down and said, we're going to go in and talk to Danny Rappaport. Uh, we really want you to be the next chairman. You owe it to us. By that time, I had I was building other companies. And I don't know why I agreed to do that. I really don't. But uh, in July, Jeff announces that he, he purchased the International Petroleum Exchange. Thank you, Jeff. You know, I thought I was going to sort of steward maybe a transition. And then a couple of months after that, was September 11th. Yeah. And I was going to move past September 11th, but I think, you know, it's so formative. You're looking at that video that I just showed. If you actually look at the video, you know, it shows where the NYMEX sat relative to World Financial Center, relative to the World Trade Center. What was your experience that day? It's amazing. I had my wife, who never would ask me, hey, can you drive my middle son, Michael, I was going to a private day school, would you might drive Michael to school? I said, Sure. And so she said, well, I want to take the ride with you. And we were just cresting the Pulaski Skyway when the first plane hit. And on uh, WABC radio, they said this, a civilian aircraft just hit the uh, tower. 
slight damage. And I texted uh, the vice chairman at the time and the treasurer, Mitchell Steinhaus and Richie Schaefer, and I said, that was a terrorist act. We are under attack. Immediately evacuate the building, close the markets, and we'll meet. When I got to the ferry, the FBI had stopped all p passage back and forth, but forth to extract wounded civilians. It was pretty... So we uh, convened as many board members as we could that evening at my house, and the next day I moved to Ground Zero. And the real hero in that story are the staff of the NYMEX and Dick Rosso. Because I called Dick and I said, Dick, we don't have any water, we're off the grid. We have light but damage, to sustained damage. I think I called Terry. I said, Terry, we might have to we might have to ship all the traders Monday morning to Chicago. He said, Don't worry about it. Jack Sander and him said, Do not worry about it. We will create the pits for all your products. They, they, we will be up and running and connected. And Dick was up and running right here on Monday, September 17th. Yeah. And we executed, we basically converted our closed network trading system, more like an order entry system, really, called NYMEX Access, to a web-enabled over, we didn't stop, staff did not stop for 48 hours and we relocated our headquarters up in Hotel Regency, Midtown, but we stayed in the building because we got access to it. So we just basically slept in our offices, and and we all held, uh, you know, closed our eyes and crossed our fingers. And Thursday afternoon, we executed seventy-two thousand crew contracts. And if not for the staff and their untiring dedication and, and members. What was it like? That evening, we had to call families of 32 members and brokers and clerks. Some of them did not know till that time, that afternoon and evening, because Paribas called a last minute meeting that morning at the top of one of the towers. And it was pretty tough. It was pretty tough. Having said all that, the, the spirit and the unity and the conviction and the courage and the ter determination, and you all remember it, if you could think back, think about how united uh, our country was as a society. To me, it was a, a matter of duty is, is what it was. But those staff members didn't have to live and eat and sleep there. And, and a, lot of, a, lot of people, a lot of those folks sacrificed their health and they really did, yeah. and we and Dick was fantastic because we had every resource at, of the, at, of the city at, at our disposal. He was really our senior commander of the financial industry in those days. So that's what it was like. I mean, you mentioned that even at the time that you were serving as chair, maybe perhaps reluctantly or out of a sense of duty, you were also becoming kind of the entrepreneur within that you ultimately always aspired to be founded co-founding several businesses pioneer futures independent bank a texas regional bank and madison tyler holdings and then virtu financial two market makers and electronic trading firms what was your vision about that you had as you were putting together these organizations well i was very lucky because i was taught how to trade by very good traders and two cardinal cardinal rules I, I was 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 in, were ingrained in me which gave me great confidence around market making position 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 risk 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 real time risk so i was very confident that i could teach share what i had learned back in, on the trading floor it was a matter of it felt to me a little bit like the military like an infantry unit because i could take a young person out of college, share what I had learned, capitalize them, put them in a trading ring, and supervise them. And I've been always been very lucky that I've been able to have kind, honest, super smart people around me. And that's not a 
trust me, that's not a reflection of my judgment of people because I sort of give everyone the benefit of the doubt. I've been extremely lucky. Well, you sort of, as you study people, you look at patterns, wondering how you think it all tied back to what you saw at different points in your life. Growing up in Brooklyn, the tight-knit sense of family and community, as well as your time at West Point and in the Army, sense of working with highly motivated, highly disciplined brothers brothers exactly. in arms, and then whether that all comes together Absolutely. in the type of people you saw down the street over there. Absolutely. That, I always tell people my leadership evolution stopped at the platoon level in the United States Infantry, Airborne Air Assault. I am not a particularly strong process leader, I'll repeat it again. I've been lucky, blessed to be joined by people who are principally simply honest, kind, of good character, who actually could tolerate my disorganized and rambling brain and wanted to join sort of a journey that I kind of uh, visioned forward. But uh, I can't say enough for the people through the years. I, I, if I say name one, I have to name 30, yeah. and I, I don't. I, it's hard to do. I mean, honest, kind, and of good character sort of summarizes them all, and the idea that you have been on this journey is also very evident through the conversation and what we have thought about our conversation. After the break, Vinny Viola, founder, chairman emeritus of Virtu Financial, and I are going to dive a little deeper into Virtu and the shift to electronic trading, as well as more on the state of our national security and, of course, his passion for hockey and horse racing. That's all coming up right after this. Shopify Editions is back with over 100 product updates and enhancements all in one place. Explore our latest solutions for every aspect of commerce, from starting and scaling a business so you can sell everywhere easier. To flexible components for enterprise needs, businesses can choose which technologies they need to create the customer experience they want. And developer tooling to customize any commerce experience. We know how important it is to offer the right mix of power, flexibility, and customization across our surfaces. No matter what you're building, you can build for the long term with Shopify. Visit shopify.com slash additions. Welcome back. Before the break, I was talking to Vinny Viola, founder and chairman emeritus of Virtu Financial, about his early career from West Point to the commodities pits to founding Virtu Financial, which we're now going to go into a little deeper. Let's let's set the stage, Vinny. It's 2008. There's storm clouds that those on the floor can clearly see. Let's hear from the Secretary of the Treasury at the time, Hank Paulson, October 14th, 2008. Today, we are taking decisive actions to protect the U.S. economy. We regret having to take these actions. Today's actions are not what we ever wanted to do, but today's actions are what we must do to restore confidence in our financial system. Today, I am announcing that the Treasury will purchase equity stakes in a wide variety of banks and thrifts. Government owning a stake in any private U.S. company is objectionable to most Americans me included. So if it's such an objectionable action that the secretary is taking, why is this a good time for you and Doug Sifu and your team to open Virtu? Did the financial crisis create the sort of environment in which your ideas could thrive? We formed Virtu. We, we had intended on forming Virtu. We worked on it from just middle of 2006 forward. It was a, a derivative of Madison Tyler. Madison Tyler had been proposed to me by the staff at Pioneer as a vehicle to create a proprietary software to then clear the equity markets. And their message to me was, Vinny, if we, we were clearing the futures markets at the time. If we can master the sort of front to back of the equity markets, then there should be modalities through which you could perform, we could make electronic your market making strategies. And that's what I proposed to Doug and, and a young man that was at my, Madison Tyler named Graham Free. Josh was kind of a continuum, right? Because the markets, even though they were volatile, volatility, especially in those days, because electronification was really just taking hold across the range of assets and products. So quite frankly, the bid offers were fairly wide. 
so there was opportunity. And if you abide by very strict risk management and very singular focus in how you define your trading, and you don't allow disposition or opinion into your models, we thought this is as good a time as any. And so that's the best I could recall my thinking. Maybe I was too naive to think that maybe it wasn't a good time, but that's that's the best I could recall it. So I mean, you transitioned from CEO and chairman to executive chairman in 2013, two years shy of the IPO for Virtu in 2015. Company now has a market cap, I think, of nearly $3 billion. Over the years, how have you seen not only Virtu evolve, but the industry as a whole? I have to say, I'm a perennial optimist, and I, I firmly abide by as the pie gets bigger, more people get fed. I think competition is a super important ingredient in the free enterprise system. The fact that commissions to retail users are insignificant, if not non-existent, I think the market structure, the national market structure, the regulation of it, and the electronic market-making component has had a lot to do with that. And I feel great about it. I'm a tad worried about our strategic financial position as a nation. I'm a a touch concerned that our balance sheet is in a place that we might not understand. We need to reinvigorate the creative engines of entrepreneurialism across our United States industries that we maybe surrendered to more efficient pricing. The CHIPS Act, I think, goes a long way to beginning that, what I call, renaissance of our technological industrial base. I I just don't want people to lose confidence in the mechanisms around the formation of capital distribution of capital, and then the, the public floating of enterprise. Because I really believe that's the sinew that drives the opportunity set forward. I mean, the sinew to be driven forward is going to have to be left, in some respects, Vinny, to the next generation. Yes, uh, a- yes. And in, in April, Virtu announced that your son, Michael, would succeed Bob Greifeld as chairman. Michael's been on Virtu's board since 2016. How far does the apple fall from the tree, and where do you think Virtu goes from here under Doug's and Michael's leadership? We're very committed to stay focused on our primary discipline, which is market making. And one of the hallmarks of the firm, and I hope it's perceived this way, is to welcome and volunteer complete transparent communication around how we do what we do, why we do what we do, and what purpose we think it serves. So we welcome regulatory innovation and the agency execution side of our business is dedicated to bringing the most advanced execution tools to as much of the market as we can. And I feel really, really good about that. If you ask me, Vinny, what do you think is a sort of low-hanging piece of fruit that would inject significant efficiency to our market structure? I I think we have the technology, if the clearinghouses are open to it, to create a real-time, straight-through processed, cleared equity trade. I get worried when I see short interest in companies rising above what I know are not liquid and available locatable stocks because the assumption is, well, they're going to get out of that position within the day or within the half day. And I'm not poo-pooing the stock loan stock borrow business. I understand that it's pretty straightforward. But I think we could we can reduce systemic risk through straight through processing in real time top day clearing. And that leads me to my greatest market structure concern, and that is, how do we create uh, end-to-end encryption standards for the market structures amongst disparate uh, mechanisms of trading, both exchanges, 
or to alternative trading systems and the like. That's my my 68 year old soon to be 68 year old rant to Michael and Doug. I don't, I don't think they listen much to me anymore mm-hmm. because they're kind of yeah you know, they they sort of kind of went through me. You know, a lot of that depends. On the government, Jay Clayton sat in the chair that you're sitting in and had a conversation. Jay is more of a lifetime lawyer and dealmaker. His successor, Gary Gensler, is more of a market structure specialist. We've had great relationships with both, and yet, you know, the tenure of an SEC chair is is short as a presidential tenure. Do we have enough staying power or at least continuation of policy to be able to enact these things from the governmental standpoint? I, I think we do, uh, but but it has to start. It has to be driven by the street. The street. I love the term, the street. You know, the economy occurs on the street, even today. Right? Uh, we're a consumer-driven capitalist society, and and I love the moniker, the street, when we refer to our, our financial yeah. structure. Uh, it has to be driven. It. Ha- I mean, the, ex- the clearing houses have to not fear that systemic change. The firms from the big banks to firms like Citadel and Virtu have to provide for them the safety and motivation to make these markets even more transparent, more efficient, and quite frankly, safe. So Vinny, sort of wending our way down, moving from finance to foreign policy, you've also found success by keeping your friends close and your enemies closer, sort of in a manner of speaking. I want to hear from your West Point classmate, Michael Sheehan, during his confirmation as the United States counterterrorism ambassador. This is going back in 1999. Mr. Chairman, in many ways, this job completes a full circle for me uh, since when late in 1979, I was first deployed overseas as a young lieutenant in the U.S. Army Special Forces. I was assigned to a counterterrorism unit as the executive officer of a team uh, known as the Door Kickers. <laughs> Later, I became the detachment commander and when I was promoted to captain. At that time, Americans were being held hostage in our embassy in Iran and were about to embark on a very difficult era of terrorism in the 1980s. Operating on a shoestring, the unit I was assigned to was putting together a hostage rescue unit that, though short on funding, was long on will, determination, and professionalism. The door kickers, short on funding, but long on will, determination, and professionalism. Why did you team up with Michael to found Madison Policy Forum in 2008, the same year you founded Virtu? Well, Mike and I were close at the academy. We, were, we had a very common view about the threat and the symptomatic display and forms of terrorism. We formed the, the policy unit so that in our little way we could create compelling narratives that were grounded in non-political discourse, almost objective data-driven descriptions of what we thought were, one, failings in our counterterrorism counterterrorism culture and and organizational structure to a brutally candid assessment of the threat. Mike also agreed to chair the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point, which my family was gracious enough to endow. And and we locked arms. Now, so Mike and I I want to say this, I hope this is not macabre, but Mike was a real brother to me. And on the last day of his life, we said the rosary together. Why do I say that? There was no, I told you I've been blessed to be around kind, strong people of character. There was no greater patriot, smarter, tougher, dedicated, selfless man. He's in top 10 people I've met in my life. And he was a warrior, a stone-cold warrior, a fearless warrior. He spent more time in the jungles of Central America than anybody will ever know. And one of the greatest sense sense of humor you'll ever find of a human being. He just had he was just a wonderful guy. So we formed the policy forum in our in our very humble way to apply rigorous intellectual information that would create then 
dispassionate, non-political debate on these issues. And that's sort of what I think we've done in our own little way. Uh, Born of the Madison Policy Forum is a wonderful resource called the Center on National Security at Fordham. We funded that. Karen Greenberg, who's a larger-than-life individual, publishes it every day. I would invite everyone to, to take a look at that. Uh, it's basically, it, it demonstrates the balance between national security and the protection of justice and fairness in our society. So just think Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Information Act, Intelligence Sur- uh, Surveillance Act, and that's the Center on National Security. We, okay. we, we like to go right into the belly of the beast and make sure that the standards of personal liberty and the constitutional rights are protected while we defeat our enemies. And so that's kind of the Madison Policy Forum. I mean, too few people, I guess, appreciate that Mike Sheehan was also sort of early on Osama bin Laden's trail and, and, yes. and tried to sort of give the warning in some ways that, you know, whether or not Sandy Berger heard it or the Clinton administration heard it is a question, I think, for the ages. In terms of keeping our enemies closer, how do you think we're doing in terms of the areas of terrorism, intelligence, cyber threats? The, the theater of operations seems to be shifting a little bit, Vinny, from the Middle East to the Horn of Africa. U.S. troops now sh- supporting Mogadishu's offensive against al-Shabaab. There's this caution that you're always fighting the last war. Have we caught up to ourselves and are we fighting what will probably be, be the next war at this point? The way I assess the state of our counter-terrorist operations, but more importantly, the state of extremist organizations, is that they've become the first derivative in the great power competition. You see what's happened in Mali, and you're seeing what's happened in Niger now. These are subordinate to the Russian-Chinese alliance. And really, this dogma around anti-colonialism, it's the gift that keeps on giving. So the Nigerian government, it's very easy to blame the inefficiency around its function on the colonial French. We're aware we have phenomenal technical advantage. We've perfected the art of eliminating bad individuals, identifying them sooner and eliminating them. But I get very unsettled that by the privatization of lethality that the Russians are perfecting through groups like Wagner. But this is all, it, it's almost synergistic mm. to a expressed strategy by the Chinese and Russians. It's not lost on me that there isn't a continuum of com- communication around that. I mean, it's not lost on me that Chinese and Russian warships are operating in yeah. tandem off the Alaskan coast. Either. There you go. So it was a great British historian, Arnold, uh, oh gosh, Tobian, I think. And I sort of paraphrased him before, but he really had this sense of history. And people should only know that the Peloponnesian Wars lasted for 400 years. They were the unraveling of the, the Greek civilization, and they were replaced by the Roman civilization. But the uncertainty is the under pinning it's the debilitator of the human spirit because humans have to feel positive safe and trusting and uncertainty erodes that i'm very concerned that we're not i think we might be underthinking our strategy vis-a-vis russia in the ukraine a tad and i don't want it to turn into a political, a matter of political expediency. I really hope our best strategic thinkers understand the gravity and importance of this of this uh, conflagration. Maybe we'll stick on the theme slightly of keeping your enemies closer. You're sitting across the table from a lifelong Boston Bruins fan yeah. who thought that the bees. 22-23 record-breaking season of 65 wins, 12 losses, and 5 ties, and their 135 points would make pretty quick work 
in the Eastern Conference playoffs re- first round against a team from Florida that was 42, 32, and 8. But that wasn't to be. Uh, so let's just take a little listen to that. Four Cousins lifted in. First one to it, Kachuk. Hit by Carlo. Puck pops in the air, lands behind the net, right in the side of the goal. They chop away at it. Kachuk keeping it alive. Carlo can't grab it. It comes to Verhage. Turn, shoot, scores! Carter Verhage! And the Panthers have eliminated the Boston Bruins! An incredible wrist shot. You just mentioned Verhage with that great regular season. That line not getting many chances in this game, and the improbable has just happened here. The improbable just happened. You did that to us in the Garden in Game 7. Thanks a lot, Vinny. Mm, that was a uh, very special moment for my family and I. Very special moment. I can't even react to it because I'm so happy for the players. I knew in chatting with other owners, we were viewed as a formidable bull opponent if we were lucky enough to make the playoffs and Terry Duffy's Chicago Blackhawks beats uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins in a really non-important game to the Blackhawks we get into the playoffs and the rest is history but that's hockey I mean, you, you, you know it Josh but I would say I can't express the happiness I had for our players they really did lay it out completely laid, laid it on the line and a couple guys left that series with broken bones and continue to play. It was, it was just very humbling. I have to say, my sons, Matt Caldwell, our CEO, Bill Zito, Paul Maurice, they've created a culture of unity and dedication down there, and uh, it's pretty special. I understand that Cam Neely was none too happy, and I've only met Cam a couple of times, but I really have been meaning to call him and just tell him how proud I am of his team for the season they had and how humbled we were to be able to upset them. It ended far too soon. And, and like, you know, I just watched Cam in the stands so many of those games, and I thought this was going to be their year. Alas, it was not to be. I mean, you bought the Panthers in 2013, though growing up you were a staunch Rangers fan cheering on the likes of Vic Hadfield, Brad Park, and Jean Rattel. Exactly. Why the Florida Panthers? My wife, Teresa, and I we were determined to retire in Florida. She spent her summers in Pompano and just loves the state of Florida. I always... I made a commitment to myself that by the time I was 62, I was going to try to evolve as a human being in other ways. So I took up stuff like fishing, and we did it. And uh, the opportunity, I got a call from David Stern, who introduced me to Gary Bettman, who introduced that opportunity to me. I had been one of the partners in the Brooklyn Nets in the movement to Brooklyn from New Jersey, and it just felt like something we would enjoy, and we have. The family's really enjoyed it, particularly my wife. She's really involved in the day-to-day business side of it, and and I'm just so happy for her. I mean, fans love to boo Gary Bettman, but he's been on the job for 30 years, which dwarfs what Adam Silver, Roger Goodell, Rob Manfred have done. What's the power of this product to the global fan? Well, first of all, Gary Bettman is a magnificent leader, a visionary. He's defies gravity in his accomplishments. He's a great strategic thinker. I think hockey brings out the absolute best in a fan. Obviously, we all know live, it's probably the most exciting sport because it's kinetic and continuous, and it's random. It is a random sport. So fans start to get in the flow of that dynacism, and it's a rough sport. And Gary's vision It was very clear that if you could introduce people to this sport, it would sell itself. Hasn't been easy in all markets, but once it hooks in there and once the surrounding communities start to play the game at a young age, our biggest challenge going forward is to bring the game to all communities. We're doing much better in terms of women's hockey, but we have to get the game into all communities. We have to make the game available to all athletes. So once we do that and we're committed to it, I think the sport will explode in a step function fashion. It's a pretty pretty international sport. 
we had ESPN's Jimmy Pitaro on the show a couple of weeks ago talking about how he's improving the televised baseball product by miking up players live. And with the pitch clock and other rules changes, I think baseball's had a great year and it's improving a lot. But hockey has always been this challenging game to watch with the small puck and the big ice on television. What big ideas are out there to keep the viewers' attention? Well, we've, we've worked real hard on puck tracking we're starting to create graphics such that they they can sort of attach to the player and provide statistics. We're trying to provide more specifics about the physics of the game on the screen while it's happening, speed of shot, angle of shot, speed of skaters. But I think it's going to take some kind of puck tracking and, quite frankly, use of multiple angle mm-hmm. drone cameras. And... Things like miking the players, that that's growing, and co- yeah. players are getting more comfortable with it. And uh, I think we're going to probably one day work with the union such that the players will wear measurable gear, so yeah. we can sort of get more telemetry and, yeah, and feel, wearables and stuff. Feel like, that. feel like really feel like you're in that player's place as a fan. But the numbers are pretty pretty bullish for the league. So. Reading my hockey news, they're looking for Anton Lundell, your 21-year-old flying Finn, about to enter his third season in the league as a potential breakout star. What does Coach Maurice need to do to bring the Stanley Cup finally home here to Miami from Las Vegas? Just keep doing what he's doing. This season was about presenting and rooting in the culture an understanding of what it takes to win, what it takes to play the game across 200 feet of the ice at all times and make the sacrifices that are necessary. I I think he's done a fantastic job of that. So more of the same. And you wanted to kind of get a little to X's and O's. Two of our defensemen are going to be out for the first couple months or so. Aaron Ekblad and Brian Montour and they're two of our anchors. We lost Racco Gudis, who's just was the soul of the team to free agency. More of the same. I think the, the Panthers now have a culture unique to themselves. So funny. And I don't, I don't like to use either allegories or analogies to the military because I think it's, quite frankly, I don't think it's fair to the military. But hockey teams are much like uh, infantry squads, you know. They, they go out there, and as much as they abide by the sy- system, they're really out there with the dual consciousness of doing really well while they're protecting their fellow player. You know the game well enough. It, it's a very, very demanding physical game. And I think we have that in our culture. Uh, I think we've rooted it. I think Paul did a magnificent job. And before him, Joel did a magnificent job. When's your first visit to the Garden? I don't know the answer to that. I'll tell you why. I can't go <laughs> to Madison Square Garden and watch the Florida Panthers play for the Rangers. It's too emotionally uh, conflicting for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I am a devout Ranger fan, but for the Panthers and oh gosh, you hit me right between the eyeballs there, Josh. So, and I don't think I have since we have the team. Now, I watch the games, but it's hard to be. Now I've gone and watched the Rangers when they weren't playing the Panthers, but that's so. A lot earlier in our conversation, Vinny, we talked about how you felt when your dad was looking over the racing form and your affinity for math and and odds and risk through that. Let's end our conversation then going back to Kentucky in 2017. Your horse, Always Dreaming, won the 140th running of the Derby. Let's return to that day at Churchill Downs for a moment. Taking the pin now, through on the inside, up into second. Always Dreaming with a two and a half length lead of 16th to go. Looking at Lee is second. Then comes Battle of Midway, Classic Empire. They're coming to the line and the dream comes true. Always Dreaming has won the Kentucky Derby. It was like standing in the winner's circle. That was a wet track. Surreal, out-of-body experience. The best thing about winning the Derby is that my partner in Always Dreaming was a fellow who was about three or four years younger than I, who I knew growing up, and we partnered on this horse. Fantastic athlete. His name is Anthony Bonomo, and he was on the same pitching staff at St. John's with Frank Viola and John Franco. And I think we both lost our minds. I really, I really think for maybe two minutes after the race, we were cuckoo. It was just, I mean, we we were vibrating. It, 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 it's 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 for a kid who grew up watching every derby, never having I didn't go to any with my dad. 
but I almost can recall just about every derby in my life if I really think hard about it from about 1964. I don't want to try to do it. But what I said after races, I wish every person who's ever watched a horse race could experience what I'm feeling right now. It's better to be lucky than good, I could tell you that. Todd Pletcher, Hall of Fame trainer, just had that horse peak performance on the day of the Derby. Thank you, Todd. I mean, talking about Pletcher, just last month, your horse, Forte, won the Jim Dandy in Saratoga. I usually get up to the Saratoga reading room once a season with my old friend Keith Mason, who part of the West Paces Racing Syndicate, but I don't think I'll make it up this year. What's next for Forte? I mean, the blinders seem to have worked at Jim Dandy. Josh, you're blowing me away, man. You really, you. This is this is a great interview. So we're going to go in Travers. I really like. I, I think the horse is ready. He had a great breeze the other morning. Irad Ortiz will be on him. I think Irad is the best jockey in the world, and we're really excited. And the best part of it is, I will have all six of my grandchildren, my three sons and their wives, with me in the box to watch that race. So whatever happens in that race, it won't compare to the feeling I'm going to have that whole day. That's a great day. That's yeah, a great day. It's, it's just a magical, magical day. Been very lucky in the sport of horse racing and very, very humbled and aware of that good fortune. I mean, everything we've talked about is about luck, friendship, family, perseverance, teamwork. I mean, from Brooklyn to West Point to... Nymex to Virtu, and, and then all of your adventures since then, Vinny. It's been great to catalog them with you and have this conversation. Well, you're very kind, Josh. I appreciate the conversation, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. As will our listeners. Thanks so much for joining us inside the SS. Thank you. And that's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Vinny Viola, founder and chairman emeritus of Virtu Financial. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at ice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Lauren Sullivan and Pete Ash with production assistance and engineering editing from Dan Wolf. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 